Hello everybody, absolutely fantastic weather once again. Having this heat wave here in the UK, it's meant to get up to around 31 degrees C today, which is about 87 degrees Fahrenheit, I believe. Could do with some rain. I looked on the, uh, the weather app and apparently uh, could be getting a thunderstorm later in the week or some lightning, but uh, who knows? But uh, yeah, so beautiful weather and it's really continued for a rather long time now. It's the longest summer I can certainly remember with the, uh, the weather being this good for this long, so I'm certainly not complaining. Now what I thought I would do is to do a video on a really, really good question I was asked in the comments section on one of my videos a few weeks ago. And that question was, am I self-sufficient? Do I grow enough fruit and veg here to be self-sufficient? And I thought, yeah, that would, uh, that would make a good video. So what I'm going to do is just discuss some points with regards to self-sufficiency because many people strive for this goal not so many people achieve it because it really is a big undertaking a lot of thought has got to be put into it and you need certain things to be able to do it so yeah so the first point I would like to discuss would be to be realistic because end of the day right if you um you know, if you strive for self-sufficiency, that could be a very good long-term goal and different ways to accomplish this. Get yourself a bigger garden, you know, help <clears throat> do someone else's garden and use some of their, their space for growing things. Get yourself an allotment, rent some land somewhere. You get the idea. But again, being realistic is key here because let's say you live 10 stories up in a flat and you have to work 12 hours a day in order to make ends meet. You know, that gives you one day a week because you're not going to be up to much probably in the evening, certainly not in the winter when it's dark. And you've got to think, you know, is this a realistic goal for me or am I going to get discouraged by it? But my advice to anyone is to just do the best that you possibly can in your position. So maybe you want to do what I've done here. Look, I've got some kale growing away in this pot here, you may remember the video where I set it, and the spinach now as well, look, the spinach is good. So you could pick them as leaves, so if, if you did live in the place I described, you could grow these in your windowsill, just plonk them in there like that, and you have got your, um, I'll give you a close up of these, they look very healthy. You have got uh, you know, at least some of your own food growing away. So. Realism is the key, but that, don't let that stop you strive for a long-term goal, but uh, just might take a little bit of time and thought. And another one would be to research what grows well in your climate. So for instance, something like spinach, I'll show you some epic spinach I've got here later on, is perpetual. It will continue to come back once you pick it. So you put it in, you grow it, and there you go, you keep picking it, you've got your spinach supply. So think about that, stuff that's going to keep recurring as opposed to something like, um, I don't know, let's say carrots for instance. Carrots are great to grow, of course they are, but once you've pulled that carrot up, it's gone. But something like spinach, kale, Swiss chard, you get the idea, you know, you could keep picking from it. So therefore have a food supply, you know, for a, a relatively small financial investment in a relatively small space. So think about something like that. and. With regards to what grows well in your climate, you've got to think of you know, what does grow well in your climate. For instance, you know that uh, I've got a peach tree. I've spoke a lot about this. I'm not going to go too much about this. But they suffer from certain diseases like peach leaf curl if they're not approached the right way. And um, you, know, you get your peaches and then they're done. But on the other hand, the space that that peach tree is taking up, think what else you could grow there. Look, maybe give you a recurrent crop or more of a, a larger crop in the same space for sort of more bang for your buck, so to speak. So maybe, for instance, let's say instead of that being there, there was a, a grapevine, which eventually would trail completely over this, this polytunnel here, and you could get a massive, massive crop with not so much of a problem, and you would generally get a larger crop for the space it takes up. So there you go. Now, this is a very, very important one. Learn how to control pests and diseases. So. Let's say you've got some lovely, beautiful curly kale, which if you follow my channel, you know I think very highly of kale, but uh, so do cabbage caterpillars, and you've got to think of you know, covering them up to make sure that the cabbage white butterflies don't lay their eggs all over it, which then will subsequently hatch, and then the caterpillars will decimate your crop more than likely. So we could go there and just have a look actually what I've done for those of you who are new to my channel. Okay, so this is the, uh, the kale here, and in fact, there is, I just flew off now, there was a cabbage 
white butterfly in the vicinity. Now, even though <laughs> this has got a few holes in it, and I have had the occasional uh, butterfly get through, you've got to make sure that you cover crops like this up because you literally can, you can lose them quickly. And if you look at it here like this, think of all this nutrients, all this lovely food that's on here. And this is once again a recurrent crop, but you must learn how to control it. And for instance, something like um, club root as well, which is a disease if you keep growing brassicas in the same space year after year. So that's things like cauliflower, kale, cabbage, purple sprout in broccoli. You get the idea. You keep growing them in the same place, you're going to end up with uh, you know, a disease called club root, which is where the um, the root goes into like a little club unsurprisingly then the, the plant can't grow properly and it seriously affects the quality of the subsequent plant so learn how to control your pests and diseases there you go just saw it cabbage white butterfly see that there you go so it's obviously smelt the uh, brassica and it's trying to get in so you get the idea and there's another one over there okay so another important one is to learn about crop rotation point this up a bit hi yes I just spoke a bit about uh, rotating brassicas with other things for club root and all that so learn about your crop rotation you don't want to keep growing the same thing in the same space year after year you know Maybe even get yourself a little notebook or do it on your computer or on your phone, on your, I don't know what they call it, scrapbook on your phone if there is such a thing. And just, you know, write what I had here this year, this year, this year, this year. And sort of like learn to rotate it in order to give a bit of a, a breather. And then other things, maybe rest some beds one year, start enriching, building up your soil, building up your, your quality of your soil with organic matter, things like manure, some compost, whatever. So that leads me on to the other, another point. Learn about composting and... <coughs> excusez-moi and build your soil fertility so you want to be thinking of the quality of your soil and I've been thinking you know about obviously there's artificial stuff you can chuck on there and I'm, I'm not going to go into a, a preachy thing about that because it's not my place and some people believe in this some people don't of course at the end of the day if you're buying stuff commercially unless it's unless you you're 100 sure it's grown naturally so to speak you know a bit of artificial stuff may have been used so you've got to think you know are you going to learn about enriching your soil naturally are you going to learn about composting are you going to learn about green manures are you going to learn about things like nettle tea are you going to learn about burying things underneath such as your runner bean plants from last year bury them under when the uh, the frost kills them because then that can release the nitrogen into the soil so there's so much you can learn about and working to build your soil fertility because end of the day it's you know you can just rip it all out and then chuck a load of artificial fertilizer down you can do that so many things to learn about and just spend a bit of time learning about building your soil because I, I read I remember someone said a while ago <clears throat> I read it or heard it on wherever your soil your crop is only as good as the soil that you've planted it in. And there is research to suggest that uh, the crops that we're growing nowadays are maybe not as nutritious as they were before due to the fact of over farming, uh, not enriching the soil properly. So soil enrichment and building soil quality is a very, very important thing. And another one is learning about nutrition. So of course if you're aiming to go self-sufficient you need to know what nutrients the body needs in order for um, you know for health really. You need to know how many calories you're going you know you're going to need for health and all these lovely beautiful vitamins, minerals, things that are you know many things that you will grow yourself such as kale. I mean kale is so nutrient dense it's unbelievable. Things like swedes, um, things like you know apples, plums, cherries, all these beautiful beautiful nutrients in there but learn about them. You know learn why the body needs them if that's your you know if that's how far you want to go but learn about what you will require. So for instance you know potatoes for the carbohydrates. So there you go learning about nutrition and another one is where to source your seeds. So of course Many things will start with, with seeds, you know, starting off small, so to speak. So are you going to go for more the sort of um, the traditional varieties? You know, are you going to find a traditional um, you know, place where which they sell traditional heirloom varieties, maybe? You could look into that. Or are you going to 
get things that aren't so traditional you know are you going to support a local producer or are you going to go down like you know like i do you know that uh, many of mine have faded a bit now you know i get a lot of my stuff from pound stretcher and um savers and places like that that's, that's what i do and you know rightly or wrongly but i do also support you know smaller companies as well and traditional ones by buying some of them you may remember some of the melon seeds i bought so think about what's behind this and what you want to do and a lot of it you know a lot of where you put your money is where you are you know you're you're encouraging that industry so to speak so if there's something you're really passionate about for instance there's someone who's carrying on a variety an older variety of let's use the example royal sovereign which is an older older variety of strawberry uh, maybe doesn't crop as heavily as modern day varieties but therefore maybe the flavor is better maybe you want to get a particular old-fashioned variety of apple something like um, there is a variety of apple I believe called court pendu plat which is believed to have been introduced to the UK by the Romans um, with lots of disease resistance because some of the older varieties that were around before you know pesticides herbicides fungicides whatever were applied they've got their own disease resistance to a degree of natural disease resistance to whatever because they weren't bred necessitating the need of spray etc so learn about things learn about things like that and another one is about storage and preserving and planning so let's say for instance once again the subject of apples let's say all right okay you fancy having a go at being self-sufficient on apples all right fine and you've got a decent sized garden or some big pots like this sort of size yeah you know and you fancy and yeah, obviously won't have the weeds in it but you fancy having to go at something like that so apples you could have an early variety such as something like there's two isn't there there's one called Irish peach which is not such a heavy cropper but early, then you've got Discovery, then maybe you consider a, a mid-season variety, and then maybe a late variety, such as something like Winter King. Now, Winter King is an apple of, um, if you check my channel out, I might even link the video down below. I did actually link, um, sorry, I did actually graft my own Winter King tree a few years ago, and where it is now, it's doing very well, and it uh, gets a nice, nice amount of apples on it. So yeah, so think so think about something think about something like that because something like Winter King can if the apples are kept properly they can actually still be edible up until April the following year. So think about that. So an early, a mid and a late learn about things. You know, do a bit of research, study the catalogs, go on the internet, have a look. You know, things about successional planting, planning, you know, so let's say you, something simple like radishes, you can put them in relatively early, but you can keep sowing them throughout the season so you've got a constant supply of radishes. Oh, there we go. And another thing, oh yeah. Oh, here we go, I'm back. A bit of uh, technical problems with the old, uh, with the old phone. All oh, right, so a few technical problems there with the old camera, but uh, we're okay now, I hope. So, yeah, with regards to preserving, you know, this is the thing I don't know so much about. Things like canning and bottling. You know, so they, these are things that uh, I'd like to learn about. And um, I know a, a Polish lady who preserves things like um, gooseberries and plums by bottling them. Really nice thing to do. Red currants and black currants as well, I believe she does it too. So all this stuff. And starting off slowly, I think, is the key. So just start, you know, with what you, what you know you could do. Maybe a few potatoes or something like that. Don't turn around and go oh yeah I'm gonna go for this and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that because chances are you'll fail because you probably haven't got the time you probably haven't got the knowledge and you probably you know you, you need to just start off gradually and slowly about uh, becoming self-sufficient and you know how you're gonna go about it so you know I spoke about that scenario earlier on but uh, let's say for instance you you know you're retired maybe or you have got a very low cost of living for whatever reason and you've got the time and the effort to dedicate to self-sufficiency maybe you're involved with a community garden or whatever um, or whatever so yeah there's certain 
things that uh, will make it easier for you. So, so for instance, if you're, as I stated, if you're retired with a nice pension coming in and you've got plenty of time, or maybe you work part-time, or maybe you, you do a job, say, where you only work three 12-hour shifts a week, and that gives you four days to devote to your project. Like most things in life, it's, you know, it's where you want to invest your time and your energy and your money, you know, and that uh, quite often can... Um, determine your rate of success or whether you're going to be totally successful at all so yeah and you've got to think about things like water costs you've got to think of your your time and your time to benefit ratio you know for instance if you've um you know it's not all about money of course it's not far from it but let's say you know the time that you're going to invest in something may you be better off you know doing your your job and then purchasing certain things from say i don't know an organic shop or a, a, a local farmer or whatever to support him. You know, you've got to think like something like blueberries. You know, if you grow blueberry plants, just think how many plants you need to get a decent crop. So time to benefit ratio is one thing you've got to consider. You've really got to think about all these things before you go for the, the self-sufficient dream, so to speak, because it's a big undertaking. I'm not discouraging people, but the key is be realistic and start off slow. And I'm sure if it really is a, a thing that's in your brain that you really want to do, I'm sure you'll find a way to do it. If not now, in, in the future, because I imagine that once one achieves it, it's very much a, um, you know, a, a a very nice goal so and also you've got to think to what degree of self-sufficiency do you want to be do you want to be providing all your own heat you know do you want to be you know do you want to have solar panels do you want to have a log burner what degree do you want to take it to you know so are you going to use mains water or is it all going to be water that you've saved yourself in water butts so think for instance at the moment you know we've not had any rain around here for quite some time now and the majority of people unless they've got loads of them or huge ones their water butts are long depleted so things like that you know what degree how much time you've got and yeah very interesting interesting project to undertake so what we'll do now is I want to show you a few uh, a few bits and bobs because you know things are coming on quite well despite the fact we've not had any real rain to speak of. Okay, so the grape cuttings are looking good. Really making sure that to, I keep these moist because it wouldn't take much for them to uh, not thrive and die in this weather because they dry out very very quickly. But. Uh, you know this is part of my long-term project for establishing a nice little vineyard here as you know I've got quite a few uh, going on already but I want some more check out my grapes playlist you'll see at a previous address my monster grapevine my late Mont seedless I mean that vine was just if I could if I could replicate something of that success I'd be very happy it used to give me over over a hundred bunches of grapes per year you know very very good but of course seasonal you see so being self-sufficient on grapes you know, it's a difficult one to achieve because they're a seasonal crop, aren't they? Which is why you need to learn about uh, different things for different times of the seasons. Well, this is one thing that's interested me. Two of my, oh, three, there you go, of my papayas have germinated. So I'm quite happy about how uh, they've turned out. The mango tree is absolutely plantastic and growing at a and an alarming rate so uh, doing well it loves it in here obviously perfectly warm in here for for it but uh, won't be true in a few months and I've already got a place for that to go so uh, that's where that's going to be overwintered not that you could see it but uh, I'll show you the leaves of the blood orange they're looking pretty healthy indeed cucumber to left the F1 coming on well and the tithonia look at that these are beautiful Mexican sunflower otherwise known as variety torch I really am intrigued by these and I'd like to know you know if, if I can overwinter one in here just how big these can get because I saw one of these or some of these I'll, I'll link the video down below actually in uh, someone's garden and they got massive last year and the summer wasn't as warm as this well it was quite warm but certainly not as long as this one and uh, yeah, it did very well indeed but uh, yeah they're gaining a lot of popularity, these are, these Tithonias. Uh, a lot of it's because I think Monty Don featured it on his, uh, on the Gardener's World. Once again, look, Tithonia. Really good. These are being grown in a pot. But uh, pretty beautiful, aren't they?
more flowers to come as well. I'm grown geraniums here, grew these all from seed and uh, these are looking beautiful aren't they? Starting to flower now and what I'm going to do is grow a load of geraniums very soon. I'm going to overwinter them because I'm very happy with, with these. Really like geraniums, lovely earthy smell as well and what I'm going to do when the cold weather comes or just before I'm going to take these up, well lift up the pots and put them somewhere because I don't want to lose them. I like a bit emotionally attached to these because uh, obviously when you grow things from seed you tend to get that way. But uh, look at that look, those little pink flowers coming on there. But uh, yeah, very healthy and happy looking geraniums. And one of the best things about geraniums is the fact that they are, they don't like massive amounts of water. I'm not saying that uh, gives you the uh, license to uh, dehydrate them but uh, they don't need masses of water so in this weather we're currently experiencing they are a great great thing to have indeed and more flowers to come all over the show look, cabbage white butterflies got some kale here that I'm growing in some in a pot here but uh, I'll cover that we'll pull butterflies or caterpillars off whatever but uh, quite happy really the beetroot in a pot is growing away well and the winter density lettuce is looking good the idea of winter density lettuce is you overwinter it and uh, eat it in the spring but uh, you know if you want salad leaves throughout the winter winter density could be a uh, thing you consider just scatter them in a pot like this <clears throat> and uh, got your leaves away you go radishes groovy looking radishes with the purple uh, purple bulbs look great don't they well they will do Pocket more cucumbers are coming on well down there as well and masses upon masses of courgettes so I really need to uh, <clears throat> start picking these a bit younger and eating them really because if you leave them too long Where's that? Oh, it's part of that. If you leave them too long, they go a little bit, uh, what do you call it? The skin goes a bit hard. But yeah, it's all looking cool, isn't it? Tithonia is absolutely epic. I mean, look at the size of that stuck up there. It's going to get huge, hoping that its uh, flowers are going to come out soon. And what I can do is proceed to uh, maybe protect that in the winter and see how well it can do if I can overwinter it here in the polytunnel. So here you go, this is what I'm talking about, about spinach. Look at the size of them leaves. So I'm going to uh, hopefully cook some of them up later on. Not working today, been flat out at work, really have. Took a day off today because uh, sometimes one needs to have a rest. Have a bit of a focus around here and see uh, what needs doing because there is a lot that I need to do. Okay, so spinach, I recommend you grow this if you want a large crop in a very small space. See you next time.